Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending this fourth webinar of the 2021 Jawaka webinar series, uh, which is dedicated to all spill preparedness and response. The total duration of this webinar will be one hour. Uh, while all participants are joining, let me provide you with some technical details uh, regarding this webinar. Um, so first of all, you have a chat where you can um, uh, where you can ask questions uh, that we will try to answer by the end of the of the webinar during a dedicated Q and A session. Um, you above where you type your message in the chat box, you will find uh, documents and PDF presentations uh, that will be available for download along the course of the webinar. If you have any uh, connection or internet problems, uh, you can reconnect by clicking on the red button, reconnect at the top of your screen. And uh, um, for your information, all webinars organized by the GRWCF project are available in replay on our website and YouTube channel. So now I will introduce myself and the team very quickly. Um, my name is Chloe Gondo. I'm Jawakaf Project Coordinator, and I'll be facilitating this uh, this webinar today. Today's presenters uh, are Saskia Sessions Poplet, who is a Senior Technical Advisor at CLM. Hi, Saskia. Hi, everybody. Um, we also have Christophe Blasi, who is a Technical Advisor at CLM. Hi, Christophe. Hey, everyone. Nice and we have Nikki Stender, uh, who is Preparedness and Response Manager at CENCOB. Hi, Nikki. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, we also have with us my, my colleague, Emily Canova. She's a GRWCA project manager. She's in the control room in charge of uh, flagging your questions and uh, helping with potential technical issues. Thank you, Emily. Um, to all the presenters, please turn off your camera so that I can uh, uh, continue with the introduction. Thank you. Um, so after a first series of um, webinars organized last year uh, on the main principles and, and general framework um, of uh, all speed preparedness and response, of which you can find all the videos in, in replay uh, on our website, this second series will focus on slightly more specific and technical subjects. Um, for those of you who did not attend the first series of webinars and who may not be familiar with GIAWACAF, I will first give you a brief introduction to the project before introducing today's webinar. So um, the GIAWACAF stands for the Global Initiative for West, Central and Southern Africa. The project was launched in 2006 in the framework of the Global Initiative, which was launched in uh, 1996 by IMO and IPCA, IMO being the International Maritime Organization, so the UN uh, specialized agency which is responsible for uh, navigation safety and, and the protection of the marine environment, and IPCA uh, the Oil and Gas Industry Association for um, Improving Social and Environmental Performance. Um, the, aim, the aim of the GIAWACAF project is really to promote cooperation between governments and industry in the spirit of the um, OPRC-90 Convention. OPRC stands for uh, International uh, Convention on All po Pollution Preparedness, Response and Cooperation. Um, that is really a key convention for all spill preparedness and response, uh, which uh, you have already heard if you were attending webinars two and, and three last year. Um, so uh, the, the, the objective of the project is to enhance the capacity of the 22 partner countries in, um, on the Atlantic coast of Africa uh, to prepare for and respond to all spills so that they can better protect their marine and coastal environment and communities. To do so, the Diawakaf project organizes activities such as uh, national or sub-regional workshops, trainings, uh, exercises, final conferences and technical assistance activities. Um, so here you can see in a nutshell what the Diawakaf project does and how it works, reading clockwise. 
uh, I'll start with the green box. Uh, so the GeoCraft project is really a joint endeavor of the public and private sectors to manage all spill risk and mitigate associated impacts. It supports 22 African partners countries in the development and implementation of sub-regional and national all spill preparedness and response systems. It maintains a con constant liaison with partners countries and the industry to provide tailored capacity building solutions. To do so, it organizes uh, workshops, training courses and exercises. And it encourages better communication and collaboration between governments and industry in the framework of the um, OPRC 90 convention. And finally, it encourages partner countries to ratify and implement international conventions from IMO and other UN bodies. So building on the first session, uh, which ran from June to December 2020 and covered the main principles and general framework of all speed preparedness and response uh, from different perspectives, namely technical, uh, legal, institutional. Um, this new GRWCAPS um, webinar series will cover more specific topics related to all spill, preparedness and response. Today's webinar is the fourth episode uh, in uh, this year's series and is dedicated to wildlife response in case of a no spill. Um, the objectives of this webinar are for you to get an overview of the key concepts and solutions in all wildlife response preparedness, um, to gain an understanding an understanding of the various techniques, policies, and um, operating procedures to protect and restore all wildlife, and to gain knowledge of the importance of a clear old wildlife preparedness plan. So to do so, um, I have with me uh, today three presenters who will deliver two uh, 15 to 20 minutes presentations to be followed by a final Q&A session. Uh, first, Christophe Blasi will uh, introduce, uh, will give you an overview of the old wildlife response. Uh, his uh, colleague Saskia will join us later during the, the Q&A session. And the second presentation will be delivered by Nikki Stender about the uh, wildlife um, preparedness and response challenges in, in Africa. Uh, she will provide you with a case study of Namibia and, and South Africa. Um, you can find the webinars program in the documents to be downloaded. Uh, you can also find more information about JAWACAF in general and our activities in the brochure that is available to download. About the, above the chat box and uh, also on our LinkedIn page on our website. And uh, now we'll give the floor to Christophe Blasi for the first presentations. Um, thank you all for your attention. So let's try to put it on the screen. Do you see my screen well? Yeah. Yes. Cool. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. So, I'm Christophe Blazy, technical advisor from CLARM. So, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, so, I will be presenting the first session of this wildlife uh, response, um, of this webinar on wildlife response in case of a noise spill. So, I'm, I have a technical problem with this sound. So. Um, I hope it will go well, you will hear me. So let's get started. Um, so I will first give you a short overview of uh, old wildlife response. Uh, then I will follow up with a introduction of uh, what is the expertise and role of CLM in this field. And uh, finally, I will present you some uh, challenges that we identified uh, to respond in Africa. So we really try to make this slide uh, focus on uh, WACAF region to, to benefit as much as possible to the African countries. So um, first of all, in terms of um, 
level of sensitivity is very important to have in mind that the three main sources of oil spills that we have identified uh, are offshore platforms, major ports, and shipping. So as you can see on this uh, slide and on the maps, um, these activities are really spread across the, the region from Mauritania to South Africa. So you have the locations on, on the screen. So the, the, the risk is very uh, important everywhere. And uh, it's, it's very important to, to have this in mind. In terms of um, ecological risks, so we uh, this list is not exhaustive, of course, but we have identified some sensitive ecosystems uh, along the coastline, including coral reefs, mangroves, uh, seagrasses, cap forest, and so on, which are very uh, key habitats uh, in your region, but very sensitive to oil spills. And they are habitats to um, endangered species, uh, for example, marine mammals, sea turtles, and birds, uh, which are the key taxonomic families that we're interested in here uh, because they are the more likely to be rehabilitated. So I'm going to talk more about this aspect uh, along the presentation. So uh, what do we uh, mean by all wildlife response? So the key objectives, first of all, are to assess, monitor and document the impacts of um, uh, the oil uh, reaching the shore or at sea and which can have a great impact on uh, wildlife. So it's very important to know uh, which species are on your countries, where they are located and when, because uh, for most of them they are migratory species, so they work with seasonally uh, patterns. So it's very important to have this in mind to anticipate the risk and um, to really plan accordingly and, and um, and have a efficient response in case of an incident. So, unfortunately, if there is an incident and uh, oil is at sea or on the shore, uh, there are different techniques that you may already know uh, through the different uh, webinars that you watched with Chair So, for example, at sea, you will deploy booms or you will uh, use dispersants to really prevent uh, the oil. Uh, impacting the environment. But in our field, there are other techniques that can uh, be used. So for example, deterrence techniques or hazing techniques, which are visual or use sound to really uh, scare away animals from the oil. And uh, there are also preemptive captures. So really removing animals from uh, sensitive areas uh, or eggs, for example, for sea turtles. If animals, gets oiled, so we have to mitigate with the impacts of oil on the species. So there are two options, either rehabilitation or euthanasia. Rehabilitation is a long process. Uh, it starts from collecting the animals where they are oiled, uh, so capturing them, transporting them in specific facilities where they will be stabilized and uh, they will be taken care of to go through a washing process and then later on be put in a, in a in pool, for example, for birds uh, to be hopefully uh, put back to in the wild uh, once they are fully, they have fully recovered. But sometimes it's not possible. They have to be euthanized because they are in such bad situation. Uh, health condition is, is very low that they cannot make it during the rehabilitation process. This is always the case, for example, when you have a um, too high number of animals to be rehabilitated and the uh, local resource in terms of equipment and expertise is too limited uh, to, to cope with the rehabilitation. In any case, it's important to optimize the resources and maximize the efficiency. Another objective is to uh, really inform uh, and involve the public, the responding authority or uh, the industry in charge of the response really have to uh, be transparent with what is going on in the ground and uh, inform the public so that they will know what is, uh, what is done. Otherwise, they might self-mobilize themselves and put themselves at risk because they are not equipped correctly, they are not trained, so it is going to be a mess and uh, it's, it can be detrimental for the response. 
but it can be also a possibility to involve volunteers and to help the response to really have a extra resource during the response. In terms of costs, uh, old wildlife response, we of, often say that it's cheaper to be prepared to plan than uh, facing a, a, a very bad reputation during uh, dealing with uh, a response if animals get oiled and uh, you have media pressure on you. Um, so it's very important to, to invest into preparation. Um, and in any case, as it is uh, the case for oil spill response in general, it's very important to ensure health and safety of, of responders. Uh, this graph is just to show you briefly uh, the geographical and logistical complexity of a spill. So you will have, for example, oil at sea uh, with vessels containing the oil uh, from reaching the shore. You will have uh, uh, booms deployed also on, on, on the shore to protect sensitive areas and shoreline cleanups potentially. And in parallel, you will have all sorts of activities going on for oil wildlife response, including aerial survey to know where are the animals that are oiled, to locate them and to inform uh, people on the ground uh, to know where they have to be uh, deployed so that they will be able to capture these animals, uh, set up facilities, transport them in rehabilitation center and really uh, make the response as smooth as possible. This is uh, under the command of the command center where the wildlife branch sits and everything is really uh, managed from there. And what is important to know is that uh, time is key. You are really fighting against the clock. You have to be efficient and quick to make sure that uh, animals, oiled animals will uh, have the best chance to be rehabilitated during the process, because it's a question sometimes of hours or days. And another uh, key challenge is to uh, deal with three pillars. So the planning, the operations, the finance and logistics, these four pillars are to be considered for uh, wildlife, oil, um, for wildlife uh, response, but this is also common to other components of a response. So very important to, to make sure that they are considered to make the response as smooth as possible and to maximize the efforts. So now that you know more about these objectives, I'm going to introduce you so a bit more about CLM, which is a NGO based in Brussels. Uh, so with a real um, important uh, expertise in oil wildlife preparedness and response. We work with different stakeholders, including authorities, industries, and uh, NGOs across the globe. So this is a very brief um, graph that uh, presents the way we work. So the first uh, phase is to be ready. So we really make sure that we have all the information uh, available as soon as possible we develop toolboxes and we make sure that we can be deployed um, as fast as possible. Uh, if we get notified uh, from a impacted uh, party, so we will, uh, for example, we will provide distant advice from our offices. And uh, if the situation gets uh, worse, we can mobilize one of our staff directly on site to help um, identify the local resources on site, and also identify the potential extra resources in terms of equipment or experts that needs to be mobilized from uh, other countries. Most of the time, external, uh, international assistance uh, in this case. And so the, the, the final step, the step three is to really advise on how to set up a emergency management system, IMS, to make sure that the response is uh, as effective as possible and to create this link between the stakeholders. So uh, authorities, industries and NGOs, which have a key role to play during a response. So when we are not mobilized, we, uh, do, we develop all sorts of activities for preparedness purposes, including developing our country wildlife response profiles. So as you can see on the map, um, 
we are covering the world. So this uh, information is uh, freely available on our website. Uh, you can you can go there uh, to have more information. We really advocate and raise awareness uh, with all the interested parties, uh, engage them to bridge gaps. So we develop all sorts of activities and projects to find solutions and uh, try to better integrate wildlife into uh, contingency plans, for example. We develop all sorts of network uh, that I'm going to present you just after. We develop good practices, training and exercises. Sialam um, plays a key role in Europe. So we uh, are observer ship with uh, different regional agreements, including HELCOM, BAN Agreement and RAMPAC. Um, so we really help them to develop policies to better integrate wildlife into um, their instruments and help the national authorities to, to include this, this topic really into the national contingency plans to develop manuals. So I really invite you to, to have a look at their websites because they have great uh, documents. And as I said, so we uh, initiated different uh, networks of experts. So first of all, the Global Oil Wildlife Response System, GAWAS. So I'm not going too much into detail here because my colleague Nikki will, uh, will present it more broadly than me, but it is a um, network of 10 organizations that have been set up uh, across the globe. And the main focus is to help uh, the oil industry facing major incidents and also provide all sorts of uh, advice. And they have a 24 on seven notification. Um, so I invite you to have a look at the website in this slide. And the second one is the European Oil Wildlife Assistant Europa, which is another network that we set up in Europe, uh, including eight organizations. So it's coordinated by CLM. And um, so the main purpose is really to improve the level of preparedness in Europe for authorities uh, mainly and here as well so uh, you have the website with uh, all sorts of great uh, documents available so this uh, graph is just to show you how uh, international assistance from these two networks could be integrated in a uh, in an ims for example um, so I told about best practices and dev tool development. So in the international level, you have all two main um, key principle standards that I shared with you today. Uh, you can download them uh, from IPCA. So really to, 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 to help uh, the industry uh, better consider wildlife during uh, incidents. And uh, on your right side, region at the regional level, all sorts of manuals that have been developed by Europa to uh, help uh, the network assisting European countries. You have the websites available. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to skip this slide because I'm just a bit late with the time. Uh, in terms of challenges now, so that to know uh, more about oil wildlife, so we have identified uh, some key challenges uh, in Sialam. So starting from our country wildlife response profiles available, uh, we did our own analysis at the regional level, as you can see on this map. So there is a, a color ranking from uh, dark green for highly prepared to red, uh, poorly prepared um, for the countries which is to really assess uh, the level of preparedness in uh, the different countries in the WCAF region. As you can see, it's very uh, different from one country to another. Uh, and some countries uh, can be very, really at the, the early stage of preparedness. And uh, for some countries, we lack information uh, to make our analysis. What is important to know is that it's our own analysis based on available data it's uh, based on, for example, the GI WACAF profiles, but also our own experience. But yeah, feel free to give us uh, your feedback 
to complete this work, to make it uh, more thorough, uh, we will really appreciate that. And uh, recently, so CLRM worked in Africa uh, with the oil industry uh, in Congo, Gabon and Angola. So CLRM worked with different experts uh, in planning projects. So we helped uh, write plans and recommendations for these industries. And we also delivered a first responder training in Angola to really uh, develop this first local resource um needed during incidents and uh yeah this this graph is to 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 show you briefly the standard approach that we followed uh starting with a site visit uh followed by the development of a plan with a strategy uh key operations uh and data needed uh for for such a plan and we helped uh defining the way to implement it uh, at the national level for, for these uh, industries. So as a conclusion, um, it's very important to know that the, there is a high sensitivity in the WACAF region due to the human activities, as I mentioned earlier, and there is so a high risk of spill uh, because you have all sorts of uh, so human activities and ecological risks with all these ecosystems and uh, sensitive species. Uh, be aware that there are existing tools to further oil wildlife preparedness a, and a global a experience available as well uh, in terms of planning, training, exercises that are available uh, to you if you need it. Um, Galways and Euro are two expert networks uh, that are um, professional in responding and advising during incidents. They're available uh, in case uh, of uh, major uh, incidents. And the CLRM, uh, through its experience and the collaboration with uh, key stakeholders, can provide you with further guidance if you request. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please feel free to ask any question. Thank you very much, Christophe. Um, I don't think we have time for your quiz questions. So what about we give Nikki the floor and we, if we have time at the very end of the webinar, we come back to your questions. Yeah, yeah no worries. Okay, I just want to make sure that Nikki has uh, enough time to uh, to present. So, uh, Nikki, please go ahead. Uh, um, and, and thank you, thank you very much, uh, Christophe. Thank you, Chloe. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our wildlife webinar. Uh, I think if Christophe ran out of time, then I'm definitely going to. So, I'm going to try and go as quickly as possible through my slides. So just a presentation summary, I'm going to tell you a bit more about Sankarp's work, who we are and where we're located, the sensitive species that are at risk, and that in particular, we're going to be talking about endangered species such as seabirds. So very seabird focused, because that's uh, our focus of our work. Um, the threats that's facing them, uh, we're going to do a small overview of the 2009 oil spill in Namibia and how Sankarp was involved in that, and a little bit about industry involvement. So SANCOP is a non-profit organization, just like CLARM, and uh, our objective is to reverse seabird population declines by rescuing, rehabilitating, and releasing them um, back into the wild. And a lot of these seabirds come in ill, injured, abandoned, um, and of course, oiled. Um, we have two facilities, one in Cape Town in South Africa and one in Keberge, which is the new name for the previously known Port Elizabeth. And these centers are strategically located near seabird colonies. So Sankop is pretty well known for its old seabird uh, rescue and rehabilitation, um, as well as our rehabilitation work on endangered species, such as the African penguin, which is the only penguin species uh, on the African continent. However, we have other pillars, such as research, uh, colony support, such as seabird rangers, um, education, and we do quite a bit of advocacy and uh, government assistance work. 
So if we look at the NOSCP, um, what we really want to speak about in this webinar is the importance of including all wildlife preparedness and response. And for many, many years, it was often overlooked or second thought um, you know, to rescue all wildlife. The focus was always on detain, uh, containing the oil and cleaning up the oil and the, and the wildlife aspect always came second. Um, so thankfully, things have changed quite a bit in recent years. Um, and for South Africa, SANCOP is listed as the main seabird responder by the South African government in the NOSCP. Um, and in addition, they have drafted a national old marine wildlife contingency plan, which focuses a bit more on marine wildlife. Um, and this will form an annexure to the main plan. And what's really important to recognize here is that the government is including wildlife as part of mainstream uh, planning, preparedness and response. So uh, really a great step. So Sankov's role during the treasure oil spill in the year 2000, it really was an enormous uh, response rescue effort uh, that threatened more than 40,000 African penguins. Uh, about 20,000 African penguins were actually oiled and a further 20,000 were preemptively captured. Uh, so this was a tier three response that required um, global oil wildlife organizations from around the world to come and help Sankob with this enormous task. And the reason why I wanted just to highlight it again is that um, more than 90% of the African penguins were rehabilitated and released, so really phenomenal um, release rate. But it was due to this, you know, fantastic uh, network of global oil wildlife uh, rescuers that came to the aid and collaborated with government and nonprofit uh, organizations. So this graph uh, really does show that uh, there's been quite a lot of oil spills over the years. Sankop was uh, established in 1968 and we've responded to every major spill along the African coastline since then. The blue graphs, uh, it is quite small, so I'll just read it out, but the blue uh, represents African penguins. And, uh, and then the orange long graph here is representing rockhopper penguins, that's the Tristan de Cunha spill. Um, and then the yellow and gray are flighted birds. So it's important to note that sensitive species such as, uh, as seabirds will always be the vulnerable taxa. There will be other impacts on mammals and species such as turtles. Um, but we know from experience that seabirds, such as penguins, will uh, almost always be impacted because they are not uh, flighted birds. Um, okay, I just want to show you this slide, which is the same information as the previous slide. However, I think it's very, very important to see these numbers um, just to bring home the message on how many numbers of birds are actually impacted by oil. And remember, these are, the, these are the birds that have actually been captured and treated for oil, uh, oil contamination. There's an unquantified number of animals that do not get captured and, uh, and die out in the wild. So if you just look in the 70s, you know, a tanker collision, 4,000 seabirds. In 74, there were thousands of seabirds. So, um, and again, in 94, the Apollo sea spill, 10,000 African penguins and the treasure, as I mentioned, 19,000. So really huge numbers of birds. And more recently in 2016 and 2019, we've had these ship-to-ship uh, -ship fuel bunkering uh, spills that's been happening in South Africa. So as Christoph uh, referred to earlier, uh, Sankob uh, is one of the 10 organizations that uh, forms part of the Global Oil Wildlife Response System, or GAWAS as it's known. And, uh, and really this has been a, a lot of work that's been ongoing for many years now, but uh, recently there's been a new supplementary service that's been launched to OSRL members. Um, and should a tier three capability be required, then uh, we're offering a four person team, an assessment team that would be available for four days so four by four um, at no extra cost to a, to a subscriber. And, uh, and this team would offer to evaluate and assess uh, to the client 
what is what is necessary for wildlife response in the first few days of an all spool. And that really is the window of opportunity that we need to utilize and not wait to respond to all wildlife. So um, just to explain a little bit more, the four people would consist of, and, and they would be handpicked from, um, from you know, all 10 organizations, depending on the capability required and depending on the uh, country in the world. But, um, but there would be a wildlife operations or planning specialist, which would fortify the command structure. There would be a field or capture specialist, which would assess the spill site dynamics. Uh, there would be a rehabilitation or facility specialist, and this person would assess local capacity in that country. And then there would be a, a species specific or um, a veterinarian um, specialist that would also attend. So those would be the four people for the assessment team. So if we look a bit more closely about this type of species that we're really uh, concerned about when there's an all spool, um, I would sum it up to these species, and most of them are listed as endangered on the uh, IUCN list. Um, I've also added the Demara tern at the bottom right, um, which is more susceptible to activities such as mining um, because they breed on land, but uh, more than 80% of the population breeds in Namibia. So really, really important. And similarly, the bank cormorants uh, at the bottom left, um, again, more than 80% of the population is sitting in Namibia. So the risk of an all spool is uh, very, very real. Okay, so just to look at these maps, um, just very briefly, uh, this is a map of uh, South Africa and Namibia, but with seabird colonies um, dotted along the coastline. Um, and most of these would be African penguins and other seabird colonies. Um, Namibia, if you look at the, the map on the right, Namibia does have a protected coastline in the south, which is the orange highlighted area. And, uh, and that forms NIMPA or Namibian Islands Marine Protected Area. And this makes up um, Africa's second largest marine reserve. Um, it was proclaimed in 2009, and uh, unfortunately, it's become a bit of a paper park because there was never any human capacity or budget allocated to protecting um, or, or even ratifying a management plan for this uh, protected area. And this, of course, is where all these seabird uh, colonies sit, and this is where they need to uh, to really, uh, you know. Um, ratify a management plan which will inform management authorities on what needs to be to be done. So the reserve is really at risk of oil pollution, uh, diamond mining, um, overfishing and poor development. Okay, this is an, an image on the left uh, of Halifax Island in the 1930s and these are peng African penguins as far as the eye can see. Um, and then the photograph on the right is Halifax Island in 2004, and this is how it looks today as well. And I think it's always a very sobering uh, image because uh, it really sh does show the level of impact. And of course, there's other threats that's, that's facing African penguins and other seabirds. But as you've seen from the from the list of oil spills, um, oil has certainly had a negative impact on the species. Um, historical threats, just for your information, include uh, guavo har harvesting, um, as well as egg collection for human cons consumption. So present day threats would include things like lack of food, uh, African penguins and other seabirds rely on pelagic fish, such as sardine, and uh, the sardine fisheries actually crashed in the 1970s in Namibia. So seabirds normally eat uh, pelagic goby, which is uh, not as energy rich as sardine. Of course, oil pollution still poses a, a major threat to those seabird colonies uh, along the coastline. Disease such as uh, avian influenza. There's an increasing uh, risk for oil and gas exploration and the associated activities. And then of course, mining activities on land and at sea. Um, risks like vessel grounding, um, and then, you know, associated pollution from that, and the fuel ship-to-ship ship bunkering. 
One of the most uh, recent threats that's been looked at in a bit more detail is noise, uh, noise and vibration that's happening below the waterline. And uh, it's quite difficult to analyze how this is impacting seabirds. There's been research that's been done on cetaceans, for example, um, but there is research underway that's looking more about um, how is this affecting seabirds directly or is it affecting the forage fish, for example, and having a knock-on effect. But the uh, infographic at the top of the slide, you know, if you have to look at the, the anthropogenic activities such as fishing, um, the, the military or the navy, uh, the sonars, seismic surveys and so on, um, and then how seabirds would have to navigate uh, through all of that activity um, and still hand for food to provision themselves and their chicks, um, maybe having a, a much bigger impact than what we actually realise. So to speak about um, some of the challenges that we experience as, as an NGO, um, and, uh, and most NGOs would experience these challenges, uh, would be that the protection of wildlife is generally not high on the list of priorities um, in Africa in general and, and in man many countries in the world. Um, and so NGOs are largely relied upon to prepare for uh, all affected wildlife. And of course, funding is always a problem. Um, so in Africa, generally, the, the government or industry does not regularly fund this type of work. Um, and that really is a challenge. Um, the government usually has a, a lack of budget as well for preparedness activities. And, uh, and we've all heard about this uh, blue economy. So boosting economic growth within the ocean usually takes precedence over um, environmental issues. Um, we really need uh, training in ICS or IMS in Africa so that we have a more coordinated uh, response when there is a spill affecting wildlife. And of course, ultimately, if um, it's legislated that industry has to have a contingency plan for all wildlife, it will benefit NGOs in terms of planning and preparedness. So a bit now about the um, unidentified spill in Literates, um, which happened in 20, oh, sorry, in 2009. Um, there were samples taken of the oil, but um, it was not identified the source of the vessel that caused the, the pollution, but apparently was bunker fuel. And uh, just to look more closely at the, at the seabird colonies in Namibia, um, the current African penguin breeding pairs is sitting at just over 4,000 breeding pairs. Um, but back then in 2009, it would have been more. However, the four uh, colonies that I've circled in, on the map here, they supported 96% of the Namibian population. So you can just imagine you know, what, a, what an Oswald would have meant at the time for, the, for that population. So 171 oiled penguins were collected from those four main islands. Um, 10 of them were probably minimally oiled, so they were um, cleaned on the island and the rest of them were taken to the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources uh, facility in Literates. This image really does show that they were obviously doing the best they possibly could, but, um, but they really lacked the facilities and the resources they needed to, to do the job properly. And uh, they would have had no access to hot water, so it would have been cold water and, and really not best practice used at all. So as, as I said, the Ministry of Fisheries have a very small rehabilitation facility, and this consists of you know, one swimming pool, one enclosure, and a, and a makeshift sort of medication slash fish prep area. Um, the facility can handle to a maximum of 30 penguins. And the image on the right shows way more than 30 penguins in this enclosure. So there's a serious risk of overcrowding um, and obviously an animal welfare uh, risk there as well. So the facilities were too small and uh, the response was escalated to a tier three response. They realized that their uh, tier one and tier two capacities was completely exhausted and they contacted SANCOP to assist. 
Um, the decision was made after several options were considered to evacuate the strongest penguins from uh, Ludritz down to Sankop in Cape Town, and uh, only the strongest penguins were selected and prepared for the journey. So it's important just to note at this point that even though those penguins were washed and cleaned or decontaminated in Ludritz, um, they can't be released immediately afterwards. Uh, there's a period of conditioning and rehabilitation that the birds have to undergo, and this can usually take several weeks, um, but they have to meet a certain criteria before they can be released back into the wild. So these birds were transported on a flatbed truck, um, and it took 20 hours for them to get to Cape Town. So this is our facility in, um, in Table View, Cape Town. Um, all penguins amazingly uh, survived the journey, and um, two penguins died a few days later, and the postmortem results showed that uh, it, this was probably due to internal bleeding, so um, issues of confinement there. Nonetheless, um, it, it was a very good outcome in terms of um, transport because it had never been done before. So after a period of 41 days in captivity, which is pretty average, um, most of the penguins were released in Cape Town, with some being released in Luderitz. And by August, um, some of these birds were observed breeding. In those days, we used to mark penguins with a pink spot. So you can see very, very faintly on the chest of the one penguin, there's a pink spot. And this was used to uh, recite penguins that were uh, released from rehabilitation. Uh, thankfully, these days we're a bit more high tech and we um, uh, insert a little transponder under the skin of penguins so we don't spray them with pink dye anymore. Uh, but amazingly, what we, what we found out was that the first bird that was released from Cape Town took 14 days to cover a distance of uh, just over a thousand kilometers um, to head back to Mercury Island. And three of the previously old birds were breeding in, in August. So just some thoughts about, uh, about this spill. You know, it was the first transboundary evacuation of the species, and it was the first time that they'd been transported by such a long distance and by road. Um, so, so really, you know, positive outcome in terms of the survival rate. Um, the evacuation was successful, successful barring a few mortalities. Um, but, you know, it's very important to recognize that this was a less than ideal response. Um, and I'll give you a few reasons why. Uh, the lack of preparedness in country was a problem. Had they had the facilities and the capacity, the train capacity, then they would not have been able, or they wouldn't have had to evacuate the birds to another country, to a neighboring country. So um, the other thing is, is that there was a delay in the response in terms of the tier three, you know, by the time it was escalated to tier three, it was probably two to three weeks later by the time Sankop arrived. Um, and of course, the facilities that were used, as I mentioned, the cold water, um, the lack of trained uh, volunteers and, and staff really did pose a, a threat to animal welfare. And, uh, and thirdly, it's important to note that this would not have been so successful if it had been another species. African penguins are resilient by nature. Um, they can um, really cope with a lot in terms of transport, handling, and stress. Um, but had this happened to another species, such as a Cape Gannet or, uh, or a cormorant species, we likely would not have seen the same outcome. So definitely species specific. But having said all of that, um, I think it's, it's important to, to acknowledge that you know, the, the, the response was handled as well as it possibly could have been. Um, African penguins did return back to their islands in Namibia, and this confirms a strong homing behavior of the species. And of course, that collaborative effort between governments and between nonprofits really did ensure a successful uh, rescue response. So to address the lack of all wildlife response in Namibia, the Safe Disaster Relief Project, which is a, um, a group of 
zoos and aquariums in the United States that fund um, disaster relief in Africa. Uh, they came together with industry, with nonprofits, um, and with government to um, to address this this very real need. And uh, why we found it necessary and not sort of country specific is that we're trying to conserve species that are declining at such a rapid rate. Um, we need to we need to have this holistic approach, and we can't simply um, you know focus our efforts on the South African population and ignore what's happening in Namibia, our neighbouring country. Um, there is a lack of monitoring and interventions by government um, at the moment in Namibia, just to in terms of lack of capacity and funding. Um, and as I mentioned in the case study of 2009, Namibia is currently unprepared for all sports affecting seabirds and other wildlife. Um, added to that, the poor conservation status of seabird species. Um, and lastly, South Africa and Namibia are both party to the BCC, the Bengbola Current Convention, and of course, all wildlife response and protection of the environment um, are aligned to this convention. So I'm happy to share that uh, industry has committed funding to um, purchasing all wildlife response equipment for two sites in Namibia so far, uh, with more in the future, hopefully, national contingency planning and training of key personnel. And this really will make a huge difference to their tier one capability. And future plans will include, include strengthening the protection of the Namibian Islands MPA and uh, building more capacity in terms of seabird conservation and all wildlife response. And industry support is really, really important. Um, and I'm really hoping that we can use the Namibia project as a benchmark so that other industry will feel inspired and uh, follow their example. But just to summarize this presentation, uh, the integration of wildlife issues into all aspects of the NOCP is absolutely critical. Um, contingency planning has to be site specific. What works in one area may not work in another. And uh, setting early objectives for wildlife response uh, when an all happens is crucial. Training and preparedness, we want to make sure that as many people are trained in instant command system as possible so they can feed into that main all uh, structure and be familiar with the roles and responsibilities. Um, the, the issue of funding is really, really important. Um, so there has to be advocacy to governments and to industry to make sure that they budget for for all wildlife response preparedness and response, not just for mainstream uh, spills. And of course, this skills transfer um, and knowledge, as soon as we know what we're doing, you know, we have to share that knowledge with, uh, with our neighboring countries like, like Namibia, but also further up the coast. Um, so we welcome you to get in touch if you are interested in, uh, in uh, learning more about all wildlife response. And thank you for joining me. Please feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, given the time being, I will ask all presenters to uh, turn on their cameras so that we can address uh, a couple of uh, questions that are in, in, in the chat. Um, Nikki, I think there is a question that I uh, directly linked directly into your presentation. I'm sorry, there is an echo. Uh, let's try again. Can can some of you turn off your microphone? There is an echo. I'm um, trying again. Okay, that's that's better. Thank you. Um, so uh, here is the question: Can you elaborate on the cleaning protocol for the old penguin? or any other cleaning protocol for old wildlife rescue or restoration post in an old spill? And uh, you're muted. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, sure, I can answer that one. Um, so cleaning protocol for seabirds would involve uh, using, a, we use a product called, um, it's made by Golden Products, I believe. Um, I can I can certainly provide that information. 
uh, but it really is a case of using warm water, but the technique is important. So making sure that um, animals are strong enough, number one, to go through the cleaning procedure and then um, using this detergent and making sure that you time it correctly. So you you have to monitor the animal um, very, very closely because it's such an, you know, such a stressful experience for that individual. Um, and the idea is to try and remove as much of the oil contaminant as possible. And then it has to go through a rinsing procedure to try and get those waterproofing properties back on the feathers. I hope that helps. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I'll take another question uh, to any of you. Uh, what is your experience with terrestrial wildlife, for example, snakes, crocodiles? What informs the decision to manage all wildlife with due consideration of personal safety? Maybe I can take a... Um, I'm sorry, Saskia, we cannot hear you very well. Now, can you hear me? That's not... How is it now? Still not better. No. Um, uh, maybe I take. <laughs> maybe I take another question yeah, while you reconnect. Okay. 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 Um, so uh, let me find. I saw another question. Uh, what advice would you give to countries preparing the NOSCP on how to consider all wildlife response preparedness? Well, maybe I can start uh, quickly. Uh, so, yeah, uh, an advice would be to, for an authority, for example, to look at uh, what already exists in uh, at the national level in terms of resource. So to really. Uh, Get to know the uh, the NGOs, uh, their expertise, uh, the, the equipment they have, but also to 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 see uh, the industries uh, if they have already uh, plans to to integrate wildlife in case of uh, incidents. So to really look at uh, what can be mobilized straight away uh, on in, in the in country and to, to have uh, this contact list, for example, that can help uh, during a mobilization to do a grand work. Uh, but obviously, uh, there will be potentially a need to, to have uh, external experts to advise on uh, how to, to train new people uh, locally on specific techniques uh, how to manage a rehabilitation center, and so on. I don't know if Nikki uh, or Saskia want to... Uh, just, I think, thanks, that's great. Thanks, Christophe. I think just to add, um, you know, it's really important just to involve many, many stakeholders. Um, and my approach would be to, to hold info sessions or workshops where you can sort of collate all of that information, as Christoph says, making sure that you take into account what's already available, uh, but where the gaps are and who can fill those gaps so that you make sure that all of that is captured in the NOSCP. Um, that would be that would be the approach. Um, thank you both, to both of you. Let me come back to the, the question that was uh, going to be addressed by Saskia. Uh, what is your experience with terrestrial wildlife? Let's Can you hear me? Then. Yes, that's much better. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is a great question, obviously, because there's many countries in, in your region where we have some of these um, more interesting species and there's some big safety considerations there. Um, to my knowledge, there's not a huge amount of um, experience with those animals being oiled. Um, I think there are a few um, here and there, um, but because there isn't a huge amount of experience, there are no not really protocols at the moment for dealing with those kinds of animals when they're oiled. So the, the Gowers and the Euroa network um, 
don't really they're not at the stage of developing protocols for those kind of animals at the moment um but the good news is that i think within both networks um and particularly with the gowers it's not just those 10 organizations there are networks within those so organizations like sankob and other members will know a wider group of, of um, experts who some of whom will have worked with some of those species so um, really, if a if um, you as an authority um, decided that these species were a priority um, for oil spill situations, the key would be really to bring in experts who know the species uh, together with experts who know oil spills and see what can actually be done and to take it from there. What kind of strategy are you looking at and how to set that up in a safe way? What would be the safety considerations? What kind of resources you would need and to what scale you could do it? Thank you very much. I'm very sorry I saw other interesting questions, but we uh, run out of time. Um, so we'll have to um, leave it here. Um, I want to thank all the presenters for their high quality presentations and, and uh, response to questions. Uh, I also thank my colleague Emily who worked with us on the organization of this uh, online event. And thank you all for attending this webinar and engaging with us uh, with all, all your interesting questions. Um, please stay tuned for our, um, more information on the GIWACF next webinar. This will be on our LinkedIn page and our website. And uh, thank you again to everyone. I wish you a nice rest of the day and see you soon. Goodbye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Goodbye everyone. Hi, thank you everyone.